A woman told me a story which I've never forgotten. It's a ghost story. You ready to hear it? So it goes like this. Many years ago, in a small English village, there was a place called Borley Church. This church was a home to many monks and nuns. One day, a monk met this beautiful nun, and they fell in love. This scared them. They knew if they were going to follow through on this love, it would change the rest of their lives. But they couldn't resist. So they came up with a plan. They would wait until night fell, and they would sneak out together. Night fell. And they were sneaking out of their quarters together. But they were caught. The priestly authorities caught them and grabbed them as they were trying to escape. They killed the monk right there on the spot, killing him instantly. With the nun, they did something far more cruel and sinister. They forced her into a hole in the wall, and they covered it with rocks. She screamed day and night. She screamed in her man-made tomb, let me out, let me out. She lay trapped in this tomb for days until she eventually died. As the story goes, she is the ghost that haunts this church. Well, a woman a couple years ago told me the story and said she was very intrigued by this nun, this ghost. And she was wondering if she could maybe get a sneak peek at this ghost. So she went to England. She visited Borley Church. And the locals told her, you need to go at night. You must go at night. So she went. She went in the middle of the night. She could barely see anything. Before she even got to the steps of the church, she had an experience which caused her to sob and scream and run away. So I asked her, so, so you saw this nun? You saw this nun, right? She said, no. I didn't see this nun. I felt her. I felt her presence. And this is the part which I've never forgotten. She said, it felt like sadness which had turned into evil. It felt like sadness which had turned into evil. She said that everything was bathed in this presence. The church, the trees. It felt like sadness, which had turned into evil. Well, this nun had many reasons to be sad. She watched the love of her life get killed right in front of her. The love of her life taken from her. She was humiliated and made to suffer intentionally. She screamed to be let out. She screamed for help day and night, knowing others could hear her, other priests, and yet they did nothing. 
All these religious people heard her plea. They heard her cry for help, but they ignored it. I wonder what this nun thought about in her tomb as she lay there dying for days. Certainly she felt sad, full of rage, powerless. But it's difficult to keep your mind focused on this 24-7. I bet her mind wandered. I bet she thought of good things too, things she would never experience again. Time with her family, laughing and kissing her lover, eating her favorite meal at Christmas time. She probably thought of the sun shining and the sun setting. As she lay in the darkness of her tomb, unable to experience it. Maybe she thought of sleeping in her old bed, of taking a walk in the local village, of the ordinary experience of meeting the eyes of another, eyes that she would never see again. Maybe she thought of herself as a little girl, so innocent so full of life, so full of trust. Maybe she remembered taking her vows as a nun. Perhaps she once felt the power of a sweet, radiant mystery. As she lay in the tomb, I wonder if these memories comforted her or maddened her. Perhaps these memories felt like a dream from long ago, another life, something very sweet, but long gone. As she lay in the tomb, I wonder if she blamed herself. Who was she to think she could be happy, that she could be loved? Why hadn't she been more careful? Maybe she should have kept her feelings to herself. She should have pretended to be like all the other nuns. She should have never told him that she loved him. Who needs love when it leads to suffering alone in a tomb? Who needs love when it can be so easily ignored? Who needs love when it leads to death? I wonder, in her final moments, if she was able to love herself. I also wonder if she screamed until her last breath or if she grew tired and weak and eventually silent. I wonder if she became cold, if she became numb, if she became apathetic. I wonder about the unlived life of this woman the love that was left unlived, the good that was left unlived, buried in the tomb. This is the root of evil. Evil is the unlived good in us. To be apathetic is to be without a path. The root of the word apathy is path. So to be apathetic is to be without a path, without feeling. The priests in this story were without feeling, or at least they pretended to be. When confronted with a love beyond their control, beyond their belief, they had two choices. Let it thrive or kill it. Let it thrive or bury it. They chose to bury it. They buried the unlived good left in this woman and they silenced the unlived good in themselves. They heard it cry out from the tomb and they pretended to be deaf. They heard it clawing at the rocks but they distracted themselves with other things. 
They had many opportunities to recognize the good, but they tried to kill it. But the good did not die. It became sad. And after the woman's death, it had nowhere to go. It reminds me of a story I heard about Rabbi Alan Liu in San Francisco. Alan, Rabbi Alan, collected fountain pens. And one day he bought thousands of dollars worth of fountain pens from a man online. He waited for weeks and he never received the pens. So he called the number he was given and a woman picked up on the other line. And he said, hi, I'm waiting for my pens. I bought these pens and I haven't received them. And the woman said, my father just died. You must have bought the pens from my father. But he didn't have a chance to send them to you. He wasn't able to. I'm sorry. Well, the rabbi had this great epiphany after that. An epiphany he later shared with his friend. When you're dead, you can't do anything. <laughs> Indeed, when you're dead, you can't do anything. We can only do good while we're alive. The great tragedy, the greatest tragedy, is not that we die. The greatest tragedy is living with unlived good in us which haunts our living as well as our dying. Many of us are living as ghosts, as faint impressions of ourselves. The unlived life is not just personal though, it's also institutional. When Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream, he was not just talking about a dream, he was talking about a ghost. He was talking about the unlived life of a nation which had yet to reach its potential. Right now, we're recognizing the unlived life in this church. We're feeling the call to live into the reality of racial justice. This church has been doing this for many years. And many know that they feel moved to step up to this call because it has been haunting us for way too long. It can be easy to think that the unlived good in us is not worth much compared to the horror we see around us. It often takes a tragedy to wake us up. We've seen this recently with the killing of Terence Crutcher waking us up to what our soul has been yearning to do for many years. We see this internationally with the refugee crisis. We see women and children in Syria killed by bombs, left bloody in the street, looking for a safe home. It bothers our conscience and makes us sick. It begins by making us uncomfortable it's too bad most of us stop here. As soon as discomfort hits, we chase apathy, trying to find some way to distance ourselves. We run. We run from the unlived good in us. It frightens us with its potential. I venture to say we are scared of evil, but we are definitely more scared of the good. If we let the good live, we know our life could change forever. It would begin to ask more of us than we ever dared to ask of ourselves. It would challenge us to include more into our, into our circle of compassion than we ever thought possible. It would soften the limitations of our love. The unlived life is uncomfortable to live with but it has one thing going for it. It's safe. As long as we keep it buried in the tomb, it won't upset our plans. 
we can keep living as if it doesn't really exist. Faint cries behind boulders, screams from far off, which we know will eventually, in time, fall silent. Silence is the most powerful weapon evil has. It's not the chainsaw. It's not the gas chamber. Silence. Silence is the most powerful weapon. Its power is in its denial. It can deny the clamoring and screaming. Silence is also the most powerful weapon of the good, however. With the right intention, silence can help us discover. It can help us listen. It can help us listen to beating hearts, to blood in the street. It can help us listen more closely to the hopes and dreams of a nation. Hopes and dreams unrealized, unlived. I appreciate Robert Frost because he writes honestly about living with apathy and sadness. In the poem I read earlier, Acquainted with the Night, Robert Frost is making a confession. He's confessing he struggled with depression most of his life. He is acquainted with the feeling of night on his shoulders. Like Frost and many others, I'm acquainted with the night. I know the feeling of living with bleakness. There's no shame in this. There's no shame in being sad. There's no shame in being depressed. And there's no shame in being without a path. This is just the beginning. It doesn't need to end there. The unlived life and the lived life both end the same. They end in death. The difference doesn't, de doesn't depend on what happens at the end. It's what happens in the middle. The middle is the juicy part. As long as we're still breathing, we're in the middle of our lives with the end unknown. What we do know is we have a precious opportunity right here, right now. We rarely recognize this. Recently, All Souls New York in Manhattan gave their humanitarian award to the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. They invited Dr. C. Vernon Mason to come speak to them. He had this to say, it is not a disgrace not to reach the stars, but it is a disgrace to have no stars to reach for. Not failure, but low aim is sin. That provokes me to ask a question this morning. Do we fear evil more than we fear failure? Do we fear evil more than we fear failure? Do we fear the unlived good more than we fear failure? The answer to that question will chart the direction of our life, both personally and institutionally. Evil is the product of an unlived life. We are all acquainted with the night. We live and breathe in a world dimly seen. The sun is shining, like it is today, but we remain hidden going through the motions, waiting for a new day. A new day is upon us. If we listen closely, we can hear scratching against the rocks. We can hear faint screaming in the distance. We feel the sadness press down on us. We're scared to death. We feel like running. 
But we don't run. We walk toward the screaming. The screaming we've heard faintly our whole life. As we walk, the screaming gets louder and louder. We feel like turning back, but it's too late. We are facing the rocks, a makeshift tomb. There's baning. We hear more clearly now a woman's voice screaming, Let me out. Let me out. Go into the tomb. Get her out. We are your church, and we are proud to be your church, or at least a church that's having a positive impact on your life. I am personally blessed to be your minister, or at least a minister who you're allowing to speak into your life. I hope you'll support our ministry and share your love beyond belief by texting LOVEBB to 41444, or go to our website, but you can just text LOVEBB to 41444 and make your gift. It's wonderful. Thank you. Be blessed and be a blessing.